Metal Gear Solid is my favorite franchise in the history of video games. Reviewing the games over the past few years has really taught me that. And after a year and some months, I'm finally back to review Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots released on the PlayStation 3 in the year 2008. It's very fair to say that this game is the single most divisive game in the entire Metal Gear franchise, although, to be fair, in a series as big as Metal Gear, most games have opinions all over the map. But some love this game, some hate it, and some are in between, and so on. I myself have not played this game since my first time around in 2016, so that's before I did the review of the first Metal Gear, I might add. I don't know what to say, I just never felt the urge to revisit this one after the first playthrough. I liked it, but definitely not as much as Metal Gear Solid's 1 through 3 or Twin Snakes. That basically stayed as I played more games in the series like the first two Metal Gears or Portable Ops. But yeah, calling this game a big deal would be an understatement, since the hype cycle was massive for this. I mean, how could it not? We just got two prequels expanding our knowledge of the lead-up to the Metal Gear series we knew and loved, and now we're going back to follow up the events of Sons of Liberty with Solid Snake back as the main character with the promise of who are the Patriots being answered for the first time. Even as someone who only played it 8 years after release, there was a lot of intrigue going into MGS4. Now that it's been so long since I last played Guns of the Patriots, I was really curious to see how I felt about it, since while it has been over a year since I last reviewed Metal Gear, it has most certainly not been that long since I last played Metal Gear. So let me first get a word in about myself and the Metal Gear series as a whole. Shortly after doing the Portable Ops review, I decided to keep playing the games, only this time with a fresh new twist that I was going to beat them on the hardest difficulties. Which by the way, MGS2 is nightmarish on extreme, much more fun on hard, all the while providing a fresh challenge that wasn't there on normal. And the most important part of this is Snake Eater though. When I reviewed it, I was unsure about whether or not it was really one of my favorite games of all time, but after replaying my previous favorite game again, it quickly became clear to me that there was no game quite like Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. I mean, at this point, I have now beaten Snake Eater on Extreme Mode three times, one of which where I killed one person, and the following two times where I killed nobody. I can even CQC the boss like it's nobody's business, which I complain about in my review. But if you want to know my further thoughts on that, I have reviews of Metal Gear 1 through Portable Ops that are definitely important for this video, although as a fair warning, I think most of those videos haven't aged that well, but still, my opinions are there. I've long mulled over how I was going to write a review of Metal Gear Solid 4. I mean, I changed how I reviewed stories in the review of Metal Gear Solid 3, but since Metal Gear Solid 4 has just so much to talk about, that I don't think that would work as well, since I have a lot to say about story, graphics, gameplay, and the rest. And I'm going to dive in with both arms swinging, praying for the best. So let's start Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots. As per usual, some obligatory facts. Metal Gear Solid 4 takes place in 2014, and if you're keeping track at home, that places this 19 years after Solid Snake's first solo mission in Outer Heaven, the center point of the timeline, 50 years after Naked Snake kills the boss, the beginning of the timeline, and most directly, 5 years after Snake, Otacon, and Raiden uploaded the virus into the Patriot AI known as GW, killed Solidus Snake, left Arsenal Gear, crashed through New York City, and had a lead in the identity and location of the mysterious Patriots who were revealed in MGS2 to have been behind everything in regards to United States politics because, as the AI said, human beings aren't competent enough to be held to such responsibility. The Patriots were alluded to during Snake Eater where we learned about the Philosophers which formed towards the start of the 20th century, which aligned with the data on the disc Snake and Otacon got in MGS2 which said that whoever the original founding members of the Patriots were, they died about 100 years ago, as of 2009. The Philosophers left behind a mass of funds called the Philosopher's Legacy, half of which was recovered by the CIA through Ocelot, with a dummy being sent back to China with Eva, as the location of the real other half was left unknown until Big Boss got it from Jean. The funds were going to be used by Zero and Ocelot for some unknown organization they are working on and hopefully wanted Big Boss in on it. And up to this point, Ocelot has become Liquid Ocelot since he fused with Liquid's personality. <sighs> I was not planning on going on a tirade like that, but still, that sets the stage pretty well for Metal Gear Solid 4. I don't have much else to say as we cut to black and actually start the game with one of the most famous opening monologues in the history of gaming. War has changed. It's no longer about nations, ideologies, or ethnicity. It's an endless series of proxy battles fought by mercenaries and machines. 
War has indeed changed, as in the Metal Gear universe, the Patriots went so off the wall that now the world economy is completely fueled by war fought between people and robots as a wave of constant market stimulation. Soldiers are filled with nano machines used to regulate the body and the emotions to turn everyone into well-oiled killing machines. Also, I love the music and the tracking shot at the beginning. It's called the love theme and it's played at specific moments throughout the game. Snake is now an old man. Still loves cigarettes, but an old man nonetheless. This would add some ambiguity as to how long it's been since MGS2, since Liquid did comment that Snake looked older in the Tanker episode, but he still got around just as well as MGS1 or Metal Gear 2. I did just spoil that the game takes place five years after MGS2, but it's still something to wonder when starting the game. More importantly, Gecko arrive on the scene and start tearing men limb from limb. In MGS2, Metal Gears themselves are becoming more mass-produced in the aftermath of the Shadow Moses incident as shown by the Army of Rays and Arsenal Gear, but a hallmark of advancing technology is becoming smaller and more compact, with Gecko basically being miniature versions of Metal Gear Rex, but still packing a punch. Arguably more so since it's just as indestructible but can get around much easier. With the first segment of gameplay just being getting away from one of these things as Snake stands no chance against it. But that was just the prologue. As the dust clears, we cut to three days earlier, as Snake is in a similar graveyard to MGS3's ending, and this leaves me wondering, why? Is this the grave of the boss? I mean, does Snake know about the boss? Was Grey Fox buried here? Big Boss? Liquid? Solidus? Schneider? Anyone? Nah, Snake is here saluting a gravestone because it was done in MGS3, and people really resonated with that. This is how MGS4 works in a lot of ways, where I wonder how many plot points and ideas would have been in the game if not for the fanbase surrounding the game, which is a lot of cynicism right at the start, but I can't help but wonder. However, fan service can wait. Otacon arrives looking about the same as you'd expect after five years, as we then learn that Snake is suffering from accelerated aging. Snake is 42 years old, and yet looks like he's 70. Liquid also warned of this in the last game. Few more years and you'll be another dead clone of the old man. The reason Snake is in the Middle East is because of the fact that Colonel Roy Campbell had alerted him and Otacon that Liquid Ocelot has been spotted there, and it's a simple hired hit. Snake is to assassinate Liquid, and then the job is complete. Back to the present day, the game is split up a little differently than the previous games. Instead of a quick prologue and then the rest of the game, we have five full chapters to explore, and again, there's just so much to say about this game, so let's start with the gameplay. I know you're surprised, but bear with me. The gameplay in the Metal Gear series has been pretty consistent up to this point. I mean, Metal Gear 2 basically defined how movement was in Metal Gear Solid 1, 2, 3, and Portable Ops, and in my review of Snake Eater, I had some issues with the controls, not to ruin my experience, but in particular, the transition from standing up to crouching to crawling was kind of awkward and in need of some kind of change. Well, Guns of the Patriots changes enough in the control department to feel improved, but it's also not too drastically different as to alienate players who have started from the beginning. At first, I was thrown off a bit by a lot of things, some of which I got over and some I didn't, but in MGS3, by using the D-pad, you could stealthily walk or crawl around any enemy or on any surface. However, MGS4 does away with that. But you really don't need this, though, since the analog stick feels smoother than ever before. It's hard to describe since all the games, even MGS1, supported the analog control, and the Dual Shocks themselves never got vastly better analog sticks, it's just that I find moving Snake around to feel better than other games, to the point where you can adjust your speed with the stick perfectly fine, unlike MGS2 and 3, which had two states of movement with the stick, running and walking, with sneaking on the D-pad being an MGS3. Other than that, holding down X while rolling will still send Snake into the crawling position, which is good. But one of the biggest draws to the controls in MGS4 is the ability to crouch walk. I mean, this sounds small, but it really does allow you to move at a decent pace, all the while staying behind cover and keeping the camo percents high. It's also good if that middle firing angle is good, but you want to move around and get a better shot. You don't have to stand up, run while leaving yourself exposed just to find a better angle. I don't like how you have to stop completely in order to crouch, but still. The more control options, the better, and MGS4 has that. The developers had an interesting choice to make in regards to the hand-to-hand -hand combat, though, since MGS3 introduced CQC to the series and Portable Ops continued it. CQC was not just gameplay, though. It was a technique that Naked Snake and the boss thoroughly developed together, which made those fight scenes so exciting to watch. But we're back with Solid Snake in this game, and he never demonstrated an ability to use CQC before. Ultimately, they decided to keep CQC in the game, which I'm grateful for since it was so fun to use, and I wanted to see it expanded upon since you can now string CQC slams while holding assault rifles and other two-handed weapons, which is an improvement over Snake Eater. 
In addition to that, CQC is a lot simpler to pull off, no longer requiring you to fiddle with the analog stick to slam someone to the ground. You just hold the R1 button to grab someone and the game takes care of the rest, with a dedicated button to slit someone's throat, meaning that you won't accidentally kill someone in this game, which is why my first attempt at a no-kill run of MGS3 ended in such tear-jerking failure. At the same time though, MGS3's more skill-oriented CQC made it more inherently satisfying to use in Snake Eater than in Guns of the Patriots. As you'll see when we talk about shooting later in the video, getting good at MGS3 is why it's my favorite game of all time. It's such a strange game from the offset, but it's so satisfying to learn and become a guru at. And I'm not even close to all the way there, I might add. But still, CQC is really good in MGS4 from a sheer accessibility standpoint. But with that, it's less fun for me personally, since with accessibility, some of the cool stuff like interrogations have been cut. Anyway, back to Solid Snake. How can they justify his seemingly now knowing CQC? Well, the writers did think of something. Hey Snake, since when did you learn how to use CQC? I got the training back when I was in Foxhound, but I never used it in actual combat. You had those skills all this time and never used them? Why? The uh, man who taught me was my former commander in Foxhound. Big boss? Never felt right using a technique learned from a man who betrayed his unit. My my, what a convenient little setup we have here. Big Boss trained Solid Snake in the ways of close quarters combat during Foxhound, but Snake stopped using it because it felt wrong to use the tactics of a traitor. Well that works, except Metal Gear 1 where Snake was aided by Big Boss until the end of the game. Why did he not just use it then? I'm sure what you're thinking right now. Because Metal Gear 1 is a game from 1987 on the MSX and they didn't think of CQC yet, right? To that end, I agree with you. I don't care about this at all. I just wanted to point it out as a way of saying, don't bother explaining things you can't explain. This will serve as a precedent since MGS4 tries to find a way to do that very thing with plot points that, shall we say, have far more weight than CQC. But for someone who hasn't done it in 20 years, Snake's pretty good at it, and so is everyone else, since evidently the Patriots released a bunch of info on Big Boss, and a quick guide on close quarters combat was included. So that's an excuse for your enemies to start countering your CQC, which was something that only the boss could do before. I like that since it just increases enemy variety, but that's enough for that for now. Most importantly though, Snake meets Drebin number 893, but everyone just calls him Drebin. In the world of the Patriots' ID control, the weapons that soldiers are using aren't even normal. Information, emotion, bodies are controlled, but so are guns, since if not being used for a purpose deemed necessary by the Patriots, the guns lock up and can't be used. Drebin recycles gun parts and opens the locks on ID-based weapons. He basically serves as an in-game shop where picking up weapons and ammo on the field gives you Drebin points where you can buy ammo and a million kinds of guns. He also injects Snake with the nanomachines needed to interface with the new weapons. I like that detail. Snake doesn't like needles after the whole fox die thing in MGS1. As a character, I don't have too much to say on Drebin, so... Snake sees this happen. Gross. But then it turns out that the idiot farting in a barrel is a member of Rat Patrol Team 01, codenamed Akiba, real name Johnny. This was the prison guard with stomach problems in MGS 1, 2, and his grandfather was from 3. I hate this. I hate this so much. It's not clear right now, but this joke character has no business farting up a storm as a main character. Regardless, Rat Patrol Team 01 has two other members that are so forgettable that I can't bother to say their names, and they're led by Meryl, making her first canonical appearance since Metal Gear Solid 1. I've had to go over this numerous times in the comments section before now, so this gives me a good chance to do it in a video. I went on record in MGS 1 and 2 saying that I personally thought the Otacon ending of MGS 1 where Snake submits to the torture resulting in the death of Meryl fit the story much better than the true ending. I've never argued which ending is canon since clearly the canon answer is that Snake survived the torture and Meryl lived, which isn't a problem at all since that just means the Otacon left Shadow Moses on his own, but as far as the chronology is concerned, the Otacon ending made more sense before this game because in MGS 2, Snake and Otacon are working together as the NGO Philanthropy, where they had the dedicated mission of destroying Metal Gears in any and all form. This is a far more logical progression as Snake and Otacon both lost the women they cared about on Shadow Moses, escaped together, and then formed this company, as opposed to what actually happened, which was Snake and Meryl escape, Otacon gets himself out, Snake and Meryl split up at some point in between MGS1 and the Tanker incident, and then Snake works with Otacon. I mean, it can happen, but it's pretty jarring. 
This is more personal, but as far as the writing is concerned, the Otacon ending of MGS1 is also a better fit with the themes of the story. Meryl was a pretty lame character in MGS1 and disappeared from the story for over half the game since she got captured and Otacon and Snake worked together to destroy Rex and save the day. I mean, Otacon was basically the only person that Snake could trust during Shadow Moses because everyone else was lying to him. I mean, there's also Nastasha Romanenko, but like, I've never talked to her more than like twice in my entire time playing MGS1. But the point is, is that the Otacon ending just felt right to me. I mean, that's just how I like MGS. Tragic, but with a light at the end of the tunnel, which describes the best moments from Metal Gear 2 and Metal Gear Solid's 1 through 3 to a T. Meryl leading this unit of losers is fine, I guess, but I found her character to be pretty annoying in this game, how she goes on and on about how much she has moved on from her personality in MGS1 and then freaks out and dying when Campbell's name comes up. In spite of that, it was sad enough to see normal Otacon paired up with Old Snake, but it's even more so with Meryl. Her still looking young and doing better than ever before has contrasted well with Snake running around with joint problems looking 30 years older than he is. Campbell evidently remarried to a woman Meryl's age, which is pretty nasty, but that's not important right now. Some frog soldiers arrive to kill everybody, and these soldiers are all women. It's worth pointing out that while female soldiers did exist in portable ops, they were a very huge minority, so this is a first. But also, that shows how many men have died over the last five years with the war economy since women are drafted on the front line. As for the rest of the escape scene, it's pretty obnoxious with the one checkpoint, cramped camera angles, you name it. Once that's over, Snake goes back to sneaking to find Liquid, and so that leaves us with a good time to talk about the rest of the mechanics. All the functions of the survival viewer from MGS3 are streamlined or removed, which is a shame. The survival viewer used to be something I hated because of the constant menu switching, but as Snake Eater 3D showed, all it really needed was a quick touchscreen access to really work well. Since we're back to the not-too-distant future MGS, we have imaginary tech like the brand new Octo Camo. Snake can stick to any surface in the game, and his sneaking suit will resemble that color and texture, and this is really worthy of praise since there are a lot of different environments in MGS4. So kudos to the developers for programming in every single texture with the Octo Camo. Just like MGS3, the name of the game is to keep the numbers up and be as still as possible to be able to hide in plain sight in ways you couldn't in previous games. This much I like, but the stamina has been removed, meaning that the complex ecosystem from Snake Eater goes with it. Replacing the second health bar is the lame as all get out psych meter. What makes it lame is that when it's short, yeah, your aim is worse and stuff, but when it runs out, Snake just collapses and you fiddle with the analog stick till it gets back up. Halfway through Chapter 2, Snake gets an unlimited supply of syringes which are nanomachine suppressors in the story, but in the gameplay are psych meter refillers. Do that and it's a done deal. Great gameplay. The camera is not just up Snake's ass during the escape scene. In general, the camera feels a lot closer than I'd like. And I mean the parts where the camera isn't supposed to be up Snake's ass. The fixed angles in the original Snake Eater release were pretty bad for a full game, but it added a lot as a secondary camera option in subsistence, allowing for a greater view of a whole room if the free camera wasn't good enough to suffice. I mean, Guns of the Patriots has more or less the same camera as Snake Eater subsistence, so therefore seeing things is not much of a challenge, but I still noticed that. To compensate for the lack of fixed camera angles, Snake now has a threat ring around him when enemies are lurking. Portable Ops is something like this in the radar, but MGS4 has a flat ring around Snake when enemies are close but haven't caught you. It will start to move more rapidly when you're closer to enemies, and then it will be red if you're caught. It works, but I did find other methods of finding guards like the night vision goggles or expanded wall peaks to be more effective for seeing enemies, which isn't a complaint since, you know, the more the merrier. But on the subject of the threat ring itself, I just think the game could use a better camera system and you probably wouldn't need it. The level design in Chapter 1 improves a lot from this point, but it's then that we're introduced to the new villains, the Beauty and the Beast Corps, or the B&B &B for short. I would say I'd talk about it later, like I always do, but there really isn't anything to say. I mean, we've got Laughing Octopus, Raging Raven, Crying Wolf, and Screaming Mantis. Combinations of the emotions from the Cobra unit and the animals from the Rogue Foxhound unit. These women have no exaggeration, not a single personality trait. All four of them have a war-caused tragic backstory, and that's it. I mean, they themselves don't even explain their backstories before dying. They die, Drebin calls, and then gives you the rundown, so Snake doesn't even react to it like he did with Sniper Wolf or Vulcan Raven, for example. He just goes, uh, okay. And when I say tragic backstories, I mean these are easily the darkest parts of the game. But it's just so forced and hammy to the point of absurdity. Drebin also points out that Snake has cleansed them of the horror, allowed them to come to terms with it, but like, how would he know that seconds after they die? Hence why it would make more sense for them to say it themselves. I keep using they and them because it is all four of the B&Bs. 
to the point where I skipped Screaming Mantis' backstory because frankly, I didn't care at all. The Cobras in MGS3, for one, didn't make a big deal out of themselves, and were also used to demonstrate what Liquid was talking about in MGS1. The good guys versus bad guys nature of war that used to be there, but whatever. Of all the things in this game's story I could complain about, I just don't care about the B&B. So Snake finds Liquid Ocelot, and I feel compelled to call him Liquid Ocelot because of the fact that I just don't see Liquid here. Unlike MGS2, we no longer see Ocelot's voice switch from Patrick Zimmerman to Cam Clark. Instead, it's just Ocelot acting like more of a maniac than usual. I don't know, I just don't hear Liquid when it's not Cam Clark, unfortunately. Another reason to wish that Liquid never got killed off. Anyway, Snake doesn't just shoot Liquid Ocelot, leaving him plenty of time to test out whatever he's working on that causes the nanomachines and all the soldiers, including Snake, to go completely haywire with Naomi by his side, ending the chapter with Snake completely defeated and in need of rescue as Liquid gets away. Which is how most of these chapters end, actually. But yeah, that's the end of Chapter 1 of Metal Gear Solid 4. So after that, we get the first mission briefing in the main story. In the Virtuous mission from Snake Eater, I complained that the opening was a little hard to get into because of the fact that there was a cool hook at the beginning, but then we got the briefing filled with info on the mission, and then we landed and we were told all the same stuff again. In Metal Gear Solid 1, you could view the mission briefings if you wanted to, however the game's story expected you not to by having the characters talk about the mission at the start of the game. The beauty of MGS2 is that Raiden wasn't briefed on anything at all, and therefore we didn't even have to talk about this. You weren't briefed on any of this? And you came in alone to boot? Why? <sighs> Chapter 1 did have a briefing in the menu, but I couldn't be bothered to watch it. So this will be our first. The status quo is that Snake and Otacon live in a plane called the Nomad. I hope buying fuel for this thing as two government fugitives isn't too much of a hassle. But with them, they have Sonny, Olga's child that was a hostage to the Patriots at the end of MGS2 that was rescued by Raiden in between games and given a Snake and Otacon to look after. Sonny is a character with no character. The only thing going on with her is the fact that she's a kid, she's a socially awkward genius and since she never goes outside, and she sucks at making eggs. Other than that, she has no real bearing on anything in the story for well over half the game, and is not interesting in the slightest. Snake and Otacon are talking about whether or not Naomi was in the Middle East working with Liquid, as they decode a video message she left them asking to be rescued in the middle of South America as she's being forced to do research against her will, with Campbell confirming that Liquid might be there. Metal Gear Solid 4 is infamous for long cutscenes, and so is the entire MGS series, but MGS4 was a bit inconsistent with this. This briefing, for example, isn't that long, it just feels long since nothing said by any character is interesting in the least bit. They just talk about the mission, awkwardly avoid eating Sonny's crappy eggs, and that's about it. Looking back at cutscenes from the first three Metal Gear Solid games, the cutscenes were really not that long on average, so the more boring stuff like Zero explaining Operation Snake Eater to Naked Snake was fine, because where it was really at in Snake Eater were those fights with the boss, tragic dialogue, fantastic moments that stick in your mind forever. Similarly, interesting dialogue was what made long scenes like Liquid's rants at the end of MGS1, the Patriot AI at the end of MGS2 especially work so well. In my opinion, you can sit through just about anything, regardless of how long it is, if it's at the bare minimum, interesting. MGS4 scenes usually have this at the start, because it means Snake meeting Meryl for the first time on screen since MGS1? That's cool and interesting, let's all pay attention, but they just go on for so long that we cut to a slideshow to demonstrate what Meryl's talking about. I also skipped BNB cutscenes after a while, because they're just so stupid. But yeah, these briefings are some huge insomnia cures. I was on Twitter for most of them. However, I'd say this one's the least offensive. The Patriots are using the war economy and controlling the narrative of life, just like Solid has feared five years ago, so finding out who the Patriots are is a top priority, since Snake believes that the data disc from Arsenal Gear was a load of crap. Now, if this chapter just started with Snake in South America and then we got an explanation of why he's there in the scene over the codec, it would make way more sense and probably have more intrigue, but as it stands, they do exactly what MGS1 did, repeat the information we learned in the briefing, but we already know it. Otacon literally mentioned Mei Ling, and then Snake is surprised to hear her name when the actual mission starts. With examples like this, why did I have to sit through a whole briefing if the game acts like it never happened? Enough story, time to talk some gameplay. How is the level design of MGS4? Well, it's all over the map in quality over the five chapters. I mean, the first half of chapter one was a bit of a mess, and of course on my second run it was easier, but on my first go I was a bit confused by how we're in the middle of a city and doors are all over the place and just don't go anywhere. I don't think it was a big deal, just something I didn't like. 
In addition to the fact that Chapter 1 literally takes place in the middle of a war zone, Chapter 2 does as well, but Chapter 1 was more drastic with debris, bombs, and tanks. After finding Meryl and doing that terrible escape scene, then I thought it got a lot better since you just do typical Metal Gear sneaking, which I'm definitely fine with as we can now pat enemies down for items as opposed to having to pick up the bodies and drag them, with the perfect finishing touch. But yeah, chapters 2 through 4 all do a good job providing areas to sneak through that are up to the Metal Gear series standards, but then chapter 5 is just a boring shootout, so oops. One idea they had for chapters 1 and 2 was that Snake is obviously a third party walking through a war zone, so therefore he has no reason to get involved in the fight, but if you wanted to, that option was certainly there for you. However, the game kind of skews this since the PMCs are after you and the game starts you on the side of the rebel underdogs, basically picking for you which side you're going to help out, if you so choose, since if you don't help the rebels you're going to have to sneak past or get caught in a fight with them. It's a neat idea, but it doesn't really amount to much, especially when the war zone routine stops by chapter 3. This game must be super frustrating to play at maximum stealth, I mean I just got blown up out of the middle of nowhere in chapter 2. Respond! Snake? Snake! The items are really lacking creativity in comparison to Snake Eater as well. I talked about how boring the psych meter and syringes are from a gameplay perspective, but this extends into the rest of the game as well. I had a whole section in my review of Snake Eater on the details and weird stuff in the game since there were just so many examples to choose from. It bears repeating that Snake Eater is one of the weirdest games ever made, and I love it so much for that reason. Guns of the Patriots is still definitely a Kojima game, so obviously there's plenty of hidden details to find and have a ball with, but it doesn't feel like there's nearly as many as Snake Eater. I love the drum barrel, though. But yeah, though, where's my crocodile cap allowing me to avoid detection underwater? Where are my fake death pills causing for easy boss kills? You certainly can't do this in MGS4. That's a non-lethal kill, I might add. Since you don't get injuries in this game, you don't have the subtleties that made it great, like how you heal one part of an injury and then not the whole thing, it will heal on its own and then expand your health bar on the higher difficulties. So Snake finds out that Campbell's new wife Meryl's pissed off about is Rose, Raiden's girlfriend from Metal Gear Solid 2. I would have a bigger reaction to this, but I feel like even Kojima wouldn't pretend this crap makes any sense, so let's just wait for the plot twist. One thing I did notice about Rose is that she sounds like more of a robot in this game than the AI version in MGS2 did. Speaking of Raiden, what's he up to these days? Well, Quentin Flynn in a raspy voice delivers info about enemy threats up ahead, like how it's been done so many times before. And Snake finally decides to ask Rose, what happened to Raiden in between games? What happened between you and Jack? After the Big Shell incident, he became unstable. Memories began to resurface from his childhood when he fought for Solidus in the Liberian Civil War. And in the midst of all of that, the baby we had together, it, it hadn't even been born yet. Jack slowly stopped coming home. And when he did, he'd be dead drunk sometimes covered in cuts and bruises. Roy was worried he was Jack's commanding officer, but Jack just avoided him. I was all alone, and Roy was so kind to me. What the hell? On my first playthrough, I had been enjoying MGS4 a lot. Thought the game was pretty good, excited to play more, and I just got to this scene. I was just left dumbfounded. I'd been a fan for like, three months at this point. I couldn't believe what I just heard, and of all the things I completely forgot about this game, that one had stuck with me over the last three years as definitively insulting. I mean, it's not that this couldn't happen, it's just that Metal Gear Solid 2's ending is one of my favorites in the history of games. It was so optimistic and hopeful after a pretty depressing journey. I could rewatch it any day of the week. Anyone you know? 
No, never heard the name before. I'll pick my own name, and my own life. I'll find something worth passing on. They taught me some good things, too. I know. We've inherited freedom from all those who fought for it. We all have the freedom to spread the word, even me. Raiden chose life and was going to build his own path with Rose, and then Snake spoke about the magic of the digital age and how the free exchange of ideas could build a more prosperous future, which countered what the Patriots said about man not being worthy of that power. These are the things I will pass on. That's what I live for. Could that turn into this? Yes, but it feels like a betrayal. Before we talk about Raiden himself in MGS4, let's talk about combat again. Shooting has constantly evolved throughout the history of Metal Gear, and with the leap from PlayStation 2 to PlayStation 3, the, in massive air quotes, depth of shooting has once again gone up. That's right, aiming in Metal Gear is now third person. That's not the only change, though. What I do like is that aiming is still done with L1, like in MGS2, 3, and Portable Ops, but firing the gun has been mapped to R1, like CQC, which makes the game feel better to play when shooting, and that's of course good. However, the developers must have been really proud of their work with the guns, because damn, there's a lot of it in this game. As I played through MGS4, it got kind of mind-numbing after a while, since I was diving for cover, blasting my foes away one by one, and that doesn't mean it was easy by any stretch of the imagination, since I died a sizable amount of times, but the alternative is trying to be stealthy with no kills, and that's not very fun either, because everyone has grenades, tanks, assault rifles, rocket launchers, and the kitchen sink. I mean, enemies outclassing you in weapons has been a thing since Metal Gear 1, but since there are so many enemies now fueled by the war economy, why not fight back? This is where Drebin's shop comes in. Back in my review of Metal Gear Solid 1, I had praised the fact that every type of weapon you would need, like a handgun, an assault rifle, a sniper rifle, grenades, a surface-to-air missile, and since you had every type, you'd only get one. But now, with Drebin points, you just buy all these weapons, and the variety is just too much. Sons of Liberty and Snake Eater were a bit more guilty in that sense, but with limited ammo and OSP, it still wasn't nearly as overwhelming as this game, where I can get like, one of four handguns and then all basically do the same thing, and even share an ammo count. Try wrapping your mind around that. I feel like they put a lot of effort into these shooting mechanics, but other than the control scheme itself, I prefer the gunplay at MGS2 and MGS3 especially in every other way. Third person shooting in general is never much of my thing, I just feel like it's a bit imprecise and there's too much blowback from firing to the point where I don't feel like I'm actually hitting anything. Perhaps to compensate from having so many weapons and having the ability to purchase ammo on the fly, the main PMC enemies you'll be fighting feel incredibly dissatisfying to beat with any gun of any kind since the classic Trank headshot still does the trick, but other weapons just fade into the white noise as enemies don't react to getting shot in specific body parts like they used to. Uh, unless I'm wrong about that. So I indeed was wrong about this. You can hit enemies at critical points. It's just that enemies are still bullet sponges in this game. So that's how I didn't know. Other than that, there were some other principles that made MGS 2, especially 3, and even 1 feel better than this. In MGS 4, weapons have a limited clip capacity, as guns tend to do. And when using up all that clip, you have to wait like 5 seconds for Snake to finish reloading the gun, which pisses me off to no end. Why? Well, because I got used to MGS 1 through 3, where if your clip had, say, 8 bullets in it, but you had a total of, like, 30, half of your clip was down, all you had to do was de-equip the gun, re-equip the gun, and there you go. Reload time was completely bypassed in all three games. The fact that Guns of the Patriots doesn't do this is mind-boggling to me since it was in Metal Gear Solid for PlayStation 1. It's not a glitch, either. It's in the MGS 3 manual in the Advanced Tactics section. It's called a tactical reload, which means it had to have been intentionally cut. Why? Maybe to make it more difficult? To make it more realistic? I have no idea, but both of these things are lacking in justification since I just want to play the damn game. Yeah, I did realize that reloading, say, a tranquilizer dart is faster than reloading it in previous games, but again, I'll take having the option of waiting for longer reloads and being able to bypass reload times over faster reload times. You see, all of this has just been personal preferences, since MGS4's method of gun combat is perfectly fine and works well for what it is, but it just bothers me personally. However, the next thing is just a straight up step back from Snake Eater. As stated earlier, I have beaten Snake Eater over 5 times in 2018, two of which were no kill runs, and one of the reasons why this was so much fun was a trick with the sleep darts. I already mentioned tactical reloads, but this falls along the same line. The sleep darts, regardless of the clip capacity, can only be fired once before needing a reload, which has been true in every game since MGS2, 
But in Snake Eater, using the reload trick before reloading means you can basically fire sleep darts rapidly. I mean, why else would someone as impatient as me bother with a painstaking no-kill run? I spent hours in the PS2 fight with the pain getting this right. This is not in MGS4. When I went back to MGS2 before this video, I was surprised you couldn't do it in that game. But hey, more power to Snake Eater, right? Yeah, but this is a sequel, and I don't feel like the skill-oriented mechanics from MGS3 have been faithfully brought into this game. If it isn't that, then it was just cut. So it doesn't matter that Snake has Octo Camo, it doesn't matter that CQC is less cumbersome, it doesn't matter that Snake can crouch walk, this game is not as good as Snake Eater as a game, let alone as a story. Speaking of story, you must be shocked how much more time has been spent on the gameplay than story. Well, the gameplay is just about done being discussed because it's at this point when the game goes so far off the path that you can't see the tracks. Snake tries to track down Naomi and my god she wins Dumbass of the Year award. She's by far the worst character in the game. The worst real character, I mean, Jesus, get him off the screen. But first, portable ops in a, a canon Metal Gear game? Almost like that game was written to be canon was approved by Kojima himself until he decided the game was wrong. But anyway, Naomi's entire character is a complete contradiction of her personality in MGS1. Listen to the first sentence she says in Chapter 2 and you'll know what I mean. I knew you'd come. Neither of us can escape our fate. What? Remember how Naomi's whole arc was thinking everything was tied to fate, but then learned that this was not the case and regretted her actions and wanted to live instead? Sneak even calls this out. You said yourself we mustn't allow ourselves to be chained to fate. Take a shot every time Naomi says the word fate or destiny in this game. Actually, no, you'll die in 20 minutes. The sad fact about this is that she does it for no reason. This game's story has absolutely nothing to do with fate. A repeated theme in MGS4 is responsibility, if anything. Kojima's one word theme for this game was sense, which is nice I guess, but responsibility sums it up so much better since Snake has no real reason to fight in this game. So many other people can do it for him, but he believes that people like Meryl or Raiden shouldn't waste their lives when this mission was caused by him, and he has no future anyway, so therefore he should finish it. It doesn't have that much depth to it, but I like it. It's just so tragic for a character like Snake. This being the first scene where the tragedy of old Snake just really gets put on full display. He can't fight the accelerated aging since it's not Fox Dye or anything like that that causes his old age, it's inherent in his genes like Liquid said in MGS2. Solid Snake and Liquid Snake exist to fight, they can't reproduce or anything like that. But it's also revealed that Drebin giving him that shot earlier is causing Fox Die to mutate and within a few months Snake will become a bioweapon of mass destruction which is again sad because despite what he says, Snake has fought so hard to save mankind multiple times over destroying countless Metal Gears, putting people on the right path like Holly or Meryl or Otacon or Raiden and all he gets for it is a never ending wave of crap. Whereas Big Boss was once a great man, but did terrible things by the end and is remembered as a hero thanks to the Patriots. But of course, there's also some pretty bad writing in this scene, as Snake is told by Naomi that he has six months till the new strand of nanomachines kill everyone, until Naomi changes her mind and says that it's the original Fox Eye strand that's gonna do that, and then changes her mind again that it's gonna happen in three months. All three of these things are in the same scene. Liquid Ocelot's plan is to hijack the Patriots' control of the nanomachines and guns and every soldier and use it how he sees fit, calling it Guns of the Patriots. And Liquid then takes hostage of Naomi again with the help of the secondly sympathetic Metal Gear character, Vamp, only second to Colonel Vulgan because he didn't have a twisted backstory like Vamp does. Let's end this chapter already. Vamp gets away, Naomi gets saved by Drebin who helps Snake escape with a chase scene as we finally get to land a dent in these geckos. Until then, Raiden arrives to tear through geckos with his perfected sword technique. This and the ensuing fight with Vamp is some expert choreography, but Raiden is the cyborg ninja for this game and his personality drives me up a wall. So fans hated Raiden back when MGS2 was originally released, I mean Wikipedia could tell you that much, everyone knows it now. But despite the fact that Solid Snake is my favorite MGS protagonist, Big Boss and Raiden are tied for second place. MGS2 and MGR Raiden, that is. He's just an edgy badass in this game with his low, raspy voice, robot body, suicidal tendencies, and self-deprecation. I hate watching him because... Was this really what they wanted to do with Raiden after his horrific backstory was revealed, followed by that optimistic ending? The answer to that is obviously no. It was just the game bowing down to the fans yet again. 
But they saved Naomi at the very least with Raiden really banged up, and he's gonna need repairs as they regroup on the Nomad, ending Chapter 2 of Metal Gear Solid 4. So the story was just starting to rot there, but now we've arrived at chapter... 3. My goodness, this chapter is rock bottom for the story and writing. So let's see why by starting with the excruciating mission briefing. Sunny still sucks at making eggs since she has no mother figure to teach that, and Naomi is here to pick up the tab. Isn't that cute? Oh, and Naomi really knows her elements. Thorium, protactinium, uranium, neptunium, plutonium, americium. So we're off to a great start. I don't know how to describe this scene, I just think it's cringy. The whole Sunny and her crappy egg cooking skills is just symbolism so painful that I would need TGX to come up with something funny here because I've got nothing. So Liquid's going to Eastern Europe to find the body of Big Boss as his DNA is the last thing he needs to gain access to the Patriot's control system. Snake asks why he would strictly need Big Boss's DNA when they're all clones anyway, and because of that question we get one of the dumbest scenes in the history of Metal Gear Solid, and I have seen many. Yeah. You've got a great butt. Colonel, I've got Emma Emmerich here. We've managed to avoid drowning. But this one takes the cake. Neither your genetic pattern nor Liquid's genetic pattern is a 100% match for big bosses. <laughs> what do you mean we don't match? What do you mean, what do you mean you don't match? Snake, were you there in MGS1 when the real Liquid's whole reason for being mad was that he was the recessive clone and Snake was the dominant clone of Big Boss? It turned out to be the other way around, which is really cool, but even if Liquid's notion was true, wouldn't that imply that there's some genetic imbalance in Big Bossness? Hence why Solidus Snake exists. You know, the perfect clone of Big Boss. Since this briefing in particular just never ends, they go over this a million times, making my brain explode every time. But to make it worse, they use this load of complete bullocks to explain why Liquid died from Fox Die in MGS1, but not Snake. Who was asking that question? Yes, Fox Die targets specific people based on their DNA, and the strand that Snake got was supposed to kill the rogue Foxhound group, but Naomi specifically went out of her way to make it target Snake himself as revenge for the Grey Fox death in Metal Gear 2. I never cared why Snake didn't die from Fox Die. He was told to live the rest of his days to the fullest and maybe Fox Die will get him one day, so that's what he did. Good enough for me. Raiden keeps splitting in and out of consciousness, and he says that Big Mama in Europe has the body of Big Boss, but he also says that they can find Dr. Madnar to help repair his robot body. Yeah. That Dr. Madnar. The guy who 15 years ago was forced by Big Boss to build a second Metal Gear for him, and he then tried to kill Snake, but after being shot by fucking rockets, he realized the error of his ways and told Snake how to destroy Metal Gear D. Call me crazy, but I just figured that guy was dead after that. Also, I guess the Patriots turned Raiden into a robot, but like, why? I don't think any of that makes sense. What haven't the Patriots done in this game? Otacon then goes on a five minute lecture about how Sonny practically lives in the computer and never goes outside because it's dangerous, which is true, but like, shut up already. Things then get sexual as Naomi and Otacon dance around having sex in the helicopter. No. Leave them off. It makes you look handsome. You think so? This scene is nails on a chalkboard. It is so cringeworthy to the point where I must ask, was it intentional? I mean, possibly, but it goes on so long that I don't care. I just want the scene to end. But the stupid does not end there as we go to Eastern Europe. Snake is disguised as his younger self to sneak past the PMCs, which doesn't work since he gets caught in like three seconds. I mean, he doesn't even walk in the scanner. He just stands there and almost starts a fight. Someone's gonna have to remind me what the plan was here again, since it makes no sense as Meryl then shows up to save him, reminding me that Johnny's in this game. I almost forgot they let a character that bad into a Metal Gear game. Meryl also gets triggered. But now you're just too damn senile to face the truth. Wake up and face reality, old snake. Finally beginning the gameplay portion, as Snake trails a member of the local resistance back to Big Mama's base. I actually really like this part if I'm honest. Finally, no more war zones, I just get to sneak around. 
I mean, the last time Metal Gear did a trailing mission, it was absolutely awful, but this one's pretty well paced. There's a lot of room to get around, to hide, putting Octocam to good use is really fun. I get to practice my perfect headshot skills and play the theme of Terra on my iPod. I don't have much to say on the gameplay in this chapter, so let's talk about MGS4 looks. The graphics have obviously seen an enormous boost from the previous games with far more detail in the war-torn environments and cities than you'd ever get on PS2. I don't know what to tell you other than it's more detailed and looks like a PS3 MGS game, but what interests me more is how Guns of the Patriots runs. Can I just say that I'm so glad that companies are remastering their PS3 games for PS4? If EXO has his 480i, then this is an area of gaming graphics I just can't take. That being early 7th gen games. While this is not the case for every game, a lot of games had this jank as all hell 720p 30fps, and most games could barely keep that dipping into the 20s. As a framerate junkie, I just can't with this. My first exposure to TPS gameplay was from Uncharted, and I had no problem playing the games on PS3. Until I got the PS4 remaster when it came out, and after trying the PS3 version again, it just seemed basically unplayable. Obviously hyperbole, but it's true. 30fps games just feel jankier in the camera movement, the animation, the effects, what have you. It does the people who worked on them a bit of a disservice. To be fair, MGS3 on PS2 was 30fps, but it was at least locked. But of course, the only way to play the game now is on PS3. Which reminds me, can the MGS games please come to Steam? Anyone? Now that I'm done with that little tangent, Metal Gear Solid 4 didn't run as poorly as I remember since when you're just running around like normal, it is a decent 30fps. When there's the slightest bit of action, which basically summarizes the first two chapters, the frame rate is going down and you really feel that. The game really could use a remaster on PS4 or PC, since as is, it's fine, but you just want to see these sequences realize their full potential, especially in the action-heavy cutscenes. As I said at the end of Chapter 2, the choreography is on point, some of the best cinematics I have ever seen in a game, but it's held back in a way. But a lot of people say that the reason MGS4 never got remastered is because the game is so tied to PS3 hardware, but if that's true, I mean, I guess. I didn't do the research, so what do I know? The soundtracks from Metal Gear 1 through Portable Ops were all really strong. I mean, I don't listen to them on any kind of frequent basis, but it's all great stuff. And with MGS4, I love the Old Snake theme as it just feels tired and depressing. A lot of the cutscene music, like the new closure arrangement, the love theme, or father and son really pack the emotional punch demanded by the story and cinematics. But the in-game music is... decent. It's just that for me. In-game music. Nothing worthy of instant classic status, like Encounter from MGS1 or Yell Dead Cell from MGS2. Now that this is done, it's time for the story to go full idiot in what has become an infamous moment in Metal Gear history where the series was changed forever. Snake finds Big Mama, who is Eva from MGS3. This, by all accounts, should have been a great scene, as Solid Snake finally meets his mother for the first time, as we, the audience, see Eva now 50 years later. But why does it fail? Well, Eva is just so annoying in this game. The vocal performance is fantastic, but her role in the story is just explaining things that aren't already clear like most characters in this game do. And she's constantly holding apples. Reason being because she impersonated the real Eva, you know, Adam was Ocelot and Snake was... Snake during MGS3. That's it! See what I mean? This game is so obnoxious with the symbolism to the point where Eva holds apples as a church as her base of operations. The only reason is because her name is like Eve from the Genesis story. How much more on the nose can it get? They don't even get the story of MGS3 right. Eva uses her taking the fake philosopher's legacy to China as taking the apple from the snake and being cast out of Eden, but that's just not what happened. Yes, Eva took that fake microfilm from Snake, but she was the one tricking him since he thought he got the real one from the boss. But Eva was pretending to like him so she could get the microfilm. And it just turned out that Ocelot got the real one and she got the fake one. That wasn't Snake's fault. Far more egregious is the plot twist of who are the Patriots. I already felt betrayed by Raiden's portrayal in this game, but this is way worse. So following the events of MGS3 and Portable Ops, all the characters from MGS3 agreed that the boss died tragically and that her will needed to be fulfilled. Once they got the other half of the Philosopher's Legacy, they put this plan into work. Major Zero, Naked Snake, Paramedic, Sagan, Ocelot, and Eva formed the Patriots, a group meant to carry on the ideals of the boss. But Major Zero decided that they needed an icon for the next generation, 
And so he fluffed up the myth of Big Boss, which was something that had already begun by the time of Portal Blobs, but it only got worse after that game. Because of the wealth that the Patriots had, they began to seep into other areas of America, and Zero became so drunk on power and only wanted more, which made Big Boss a bit uncomfortable, and that was when this now crazy Zero decided that he needed to keep Big Boss around with or without Big Boss, which is when he had taken Big Boss's DNA and used it alongside Eva as the surrogate mother to carry the clones, Solid Snake, and Liquid Snake. This scene goes into so much gratuitous detail to show how dedicated this game is to fucking up the series. This twist was such an out of left field mess that Kojima and company had to spend the rest of the franchise justifying it. So let's go over some basic problems with this scene from a logic point of view. So if Solid Snake does not know who the boss is, then what was the point of the grave salute? Just to get our nostalgia bone tingling? Also, again with this CIA wanted the boss gone. This was mentioned in Portable Ops and continues to get confirmation when, for me, the beauty of the story in MGS3 is that the boss got dealt a crappy hand in the need for pawns in the USA-USSR conflict. Nothing more to it than that, which is why she wished for soldiers to not have political ideologies. But regardless, Big Boss was so mad that he was used like this that he struck out and made Outer Heaven and Zanzibar Land in an attempt to destroy Zero and his patriots. Not because he was a warmonger who took the boss's will the wrong way, he was a hero all along. And Solid Snake was a pawn of the patriots when he stopped Big Boss both times. I just hate how these great characters are portrayed here. Zero especially is so villainized for no reason. MGS3, he was a really nice guy who was stuck in the same crappy position as Snake, but he still had a wit and quirky personality to him that stayed true throughout the mission. Metal Gear Solid 2 showed us a legitimately scary conspiracy that ran through the USA with loads of points that actually made sense and are still relevant to this day. And this game decides to merge that with a cast of funny, lighthearted characters from 3. That is just a crappy, crappy idea that spawns from this game's biggest problem, trying to explain Metal Gear Solid, which I can talk about later. Despite how many slideshows there are, and us already knowing that Zero grew the Patriots up even to the Oval Office sometime during the MSX era, nobody clearly explains how this shit works, and why. Like, did Zero have a staff of people that made creepy AIs? I didn't know he was a brilliant programmer. He wanted control. Okay, and after GW got wrecked at the Big Shell, the AIs went out of control, creating the war economy, which evidently only exists in smaller countries since the awful mission briefing of the next chapter clearly shows us... How's the White House responding? The public? The president has yet to make an official announcement. But the world of MGS4 in 2014 does not leave room for a president with the economy fueled by war, and not war driven by race or liberty, but profit because of the Patriot AI going off the wall. <laughs> Looks like I got that one wrong, but it's not the first and it won't be the last. But I don't get it though. So before GW went crazy in Sons of Liberty, the Patriots worked behind the scenes to fake politics and control everything, and after that they still do that? Only now they have effect over smaller countries. Remember, the Patriots were made in America and worked in America, and the Philosophers were the ones that were on the global scale. This makes no sense. Another thing they do for absolutely no reason is the fact that Paramedic is the psychopath who turned Grey Fox into the Cyborg Ninja from MGS1, which is completely absurd. Starting with how in MGS1, Naomi was the one who told us about Dr. Clark and his experiments on Grey Fox. My predecessor, Dr. Clark, was in charge. Dr. Clark? Yes. He started the gene therapy project. And where is he now? He was killed in an explosion in his lab two years ago. She didn't just make a mistake, she spoke as if she knew the man personally. This game also retconned the gender of Sonny since she was referred to as a boy in MGS2, but there's a big difference here. I just said Naomi spoke about Dr. Clark like she knew him, but Olga never said the gender of her child, and Snake just assumed he. Snake, what about Olga's child? Don't worry, I'll find him. Count on it. I used to brush stuff like this off like it was nothing, but in the time from my MGS1 review to now, I no longer stand for crappy plot lines like this. From a character perspective, you want me to buy the fact that the silly medic who cared for Naked Snake but also had casual talks about the new Godzilla movie is the same crazy person who did this to Great Fox. Sorry, that is Penelope from Sly 4 levels of bad. Ocelot and Eva were very anti-Zero while Big Boss was running Outer Heaven in Zanzibar, and when he was defeated by Snake in Metal Gear 2, I was about to say killed, but even then I don't even know if that's true anymore. 
Now the Patriots got their hands on the body, and Ocelot and Eva have been trying to get it back, and in an attempt to fool the system, Ocelot used hypnotherapy and nanomachines to convince himself that he is liquid, but lost himself to the treatment. Nanomachines is also how Psycho Madness manipulates people, and how Vamp gets up from being shot in the head. No. Just. No. That is not how this works. For some reason, this game is so against the idea of magic and supernatural elements being in Metal Gear. And technically that was started in MGS2 at the end. There's no such thing as miracles or the supernatural. Only cutting edge technology. But everything spoke to the contrary of what Ocelot had said. I mean, you could pretend that nanomachines are how these characters had their crazy powers. What's your excuse for Snake Eater? I mean, a game that took place in 1964. How was the end photosynthetic? How did the pain produce bees from his innards? How was the sorrow a spirit medium if those things don't exist? The sorrow and the boss are the parents of Asla, and I thought the sorrow being a spirit medium was a cool explanation for Liquid inexplicably taking over Ocelot via his arm. That Ocelot channeled his spirit, and that would make sense to me, but this game tries so hard to denounce fantasy for Metal Gear that it shoots itself in the foot in the process, and man, this scene really needs to shut the fuck up about FPS games affecting kids. I mean, we get it. Zero is an evil monster, yada, yada, yada. Don't rub it in. MGS3 did this sort of thing in the gameplay and not spouting it at me in the middle of a chase scene. Being a part of the gameplay, actually giving you a reason to care about the violence you could be unleashing is another reason why Snake Eater is so great. The game has a million and one ways to deal away with threats non-lethally and that's awesome. It was what motivated me to try the game non-lethally when other MGS games don't draw those emotions out of me, even if the first four games still handle that message in the story pretty well. So yeah, this chapter's story is fucking terrible. Now then, let's go back to the game with this garbage chase scene. There's been a chase scene in most Metal Gear games, however, it makes them work much more than this, is that you weren't going as so fast as to lose your ability to hit anything. And to make it worse, you have to reload like every four seconds because you can't tactically reload in this game. But the car crashes as Snake has to battle the second of the B&Bs, Raging Raven, which leads me to the boss fights. The bosses are very split in this game. Laughing Octopus tries to do cool tricks like impersonating characters or objects in the room, and Crying Wolf does the whole sniper thing the second best of any MGS game since we have such harsh conditions to deal with since the snow's blowing in your face, and you have a massive arena to play around with. It makes for a cool atmosphere. The final boss can be safe for later though. But the other two B&Bs are just the worst. Well, let's first toss Laughing Octopus into the mix because of the fact that her boss has good ideas, but at the same time, all of those bosses suffer from the issues that came from the game being a TPS. Since MGS 2 and 3 were not games about shooting, landing a good shot was far more valued. Like, remember the Vamp boss and how a well-placed headshot took off such a massive chunk of health? Or the Olga boss? Or the end? Vulgan? Boss? The fear? The pain? Here, I just unload clip after clip into these guys and they just won't die. Raging Raven being the absolute worst in the game as she won't hold still as I keep firing away and when my shots do connect, again it whittles the health bar away so slowly that it feels like I'm not doing damage at all. Especially since the bosses have no reaction to being hit at critical points. Screaming Mantis involves you running around like a buffoon, spending more time reloading your guns than firing them as you need to realize that nanomachines are the reason you can't land a hit, and when you realize that, the boss ends in literally 5 seconds. <laughs> So, Snake and Big Mama escape from the sewers only to find Liquid waiting for them. Alright Snake, you've been hired by Campbell to find and assassinate Liquid Ocelot, and here he is, sitting there, smoking a cigar, pull the trigger and end this! What the hell? Shoot him! Okay, he revealed he has the body. SHOOT HIM! Why does he not just shoot him? So Eva sees that the ship carrying Big Boss's body is in flames and starts to cry as Snake asks another completely ridiculous question. Is that it? Like, dude, are you an idiot? What? Metal Gear. What? Well, sort of. But is he a senile idiot? What? I knew the number. In fact, I remembered it just now. Well, pretty much. So instead of taking the chance to just shoot Liquid that he had like three minutes ago, Snake instead decides to fight Liquid and gets completely dominated and never decides to take that knife out of his shoulder for the whole rest of the scene. It turns out that Naomi's still working with Liquid Ocelot since she left after leaving Raiden with Madnar off screen. There'll be plenty of time for Naomi in the next chapter though. Next, Liquid, Vamp, and Naomi are cornered by the entire military and Meryl's team, but in a shocking twist that takes 36 minutes to unfold, Liquid has controlled the system and shuts off everyone's guns. 
as Meryl's team go flying into the water as Liquid gives Snake and Eva the body of Big Boss back as he turns to Ash and Eva tries to burn alongside him before Snake gets her out of there and gets a little burn on his face too. I would not have sarcastically skimmed that whole scene if I cared just that little bit more. I mean, by this point, that abysmal briefing happened, we learn that some of the most fun and energetic Metal Gear characters were responsible for government conspiracies, and Snake didn't just shoot Liquid for the second time causing all of this. This chapter's story was a catastrophic disaster. So needless to say, all I wanted was to shut the game off, as I'm sure a lot of fans were feeling after that massive, air quotes, twist. But yeah, Eva dies spouting poetry, but things get even worse when Johnny saves Meryl and pulls off his mask to resuscitate her and reveals that he's drop dead gorgeous on the inside. If revealing Major Zero and the MGS3 cast as the main villains of the century wasn't enough, then this is the moment when the game definitively jumps the shark. This mound of diseased hyena filth was a joke character. He was laughably incompetent at his job, but not only did he shit his pants right in our faces for the first half of the game, but now he's super good looking and is gonna be in a romance with Meryl. Is this a joke? No, it's not a joke. I wish it was a joke, since that would make this country-sized pill that 1% easier to swallow. Like, seriously, everything relating to this guy pisses me off so much. He's the worst character in the series because his presence pre-reveal was so annoying and gross, but everything after that's just so cringeworthy and makes no sense. That is the note this chapter ends on. I really liked that stealth section, but good god almighty, the chase, the boss, the story especially were rotting more than Johnny's pants in chapter 1. As I said, at this point, I just wanted to put the game down and never look back. But we're almost done. Bring on chapter 4. So now that we've reached chapter 4, the game has jumped the shark. It's totally possible for the game to still have good moments, but the Metal Gear I love ceases to exist in the Metal Gear series from this point on because of that last chapter. My thoughts on the gameplay are covered, so let's see how the game ends. This mission briefing is mercifully not as bad as the last one, as we see that Otacon snuck the Mark II onto the ship Liquid was on, and... <sighs> Can the shot stare up Naomi's legs and it's just getting weird in here. Liquid does not have the capacity to beat the Patriots with nukes, and for that he's going to need the only nukes left on Earth not controlled by the Patriots, and that's the railgun left behind by Metal Gear Rex on Shadow Moses Island, a place that not a soul has set foot on since the incident in MGS1. So we hate the war economy, right? Snake and company wanted that dealt with, right? So Liquid just did that. It's the first total ceasefire in human history. So, are we going to try and stop Liquid from ruling the system himself? I'm asking because I genuinely don't get it. The plot of this game is so confusing because the dialogue is so meandering. No better example than this briefing where Campbell announces we need to go to Shadow Moses and instead of just saying it, we get like a paragraph describing the island, almost to make sure fanboys have their tongue firmly drooling before saying the name already. Despite all that, this briefing does have some good scenes that carry real weight and fall in line with the responsibility theme I talked about earlier. Face it, Snake. We've lost. <coughs> Otacon. We never stood a chance. <laughs> it's not about winning or losing. I know we started this. But yes, we are returning to Shadow Moses Island, and after playing the opening of MGS1 again, we're reminded of how cutting edge that game was for its time, and how cool and how new it was. This is the kind of nostalgia I like, taking what's old and making it feel new again. In this case, feeling new is feeling older than ever. I think it's fair to say that most players who played Metal Gear Solid had never played a game like it before, and it was such an engaging experience because of that. But now we're back to the classic location that introduced so many to this world as Snake jumps off the helicopter with back problems. This part is sad, but it's beautiful at the same time. Half of the island is slipping away into the ocean with the other half to follow, 
and nobody has been here in nine years, and it feels like it. The place is dirty and dying as the surveillance cameras fall and break. The snow covers everything outside, the lava in the furnace is dried up, technology needs to be booted up again, Shadow Moses is dripping with more atmosphere than ever before. Gameplay wise, this is the absolute highlight of the game. The level design is built off the back of a game that already had good level design, and they also decided to do new things with it as we explored previously unexplored areas of the facility to get around since pathways we used in MGS1 are in that much disrepair. Also, the Gecko and Dwarf Gecko are great here, since we're back in the cramped and isolated environments from MGS1, making encounters with these guys feel more intense. Finally, this game's fetish with references and callbacks can finally be applied well, since again, it contrasts the events of MGS1 so well with the present day. But I noticed something a little off about the audio. It's Snake. I'm in front of the disposal facility. Excellent, Snake. How is that sneaking suit working out? I'm nice and dry, but it's a little hard to move. Oh no, not the twin snakes! That's even worse than acknowledging the existence of Portable Ops. Obviously I'm kidding, since I for one think Portable Ops is canon, better than Peace Walker, and a good game in general. And I think the Twin Snakes is an underrated game that while not replacing the original, it certainly is a great game in its own right. I believe that they used the Twin Snakes audio for MGS1 callbacks because of the higher quality, but there's already a filter over it to make it flashbacky and echoey, so I doubt anyone would notice. Personally, I would rather them use the original takes since MGS1 is and always has been the canon version of the Shadow Moses incident, but I also do get it since MGS1 is a bit of an outlier when it comes to MGS voice acting. Since Snake sounds different to the 6th gen games, Naomi and Mei Ling had accents that they don't have in this game, and as a result, the Twin Snakes audio technically falls in line with this game easier on a sheer sound level, but again, I don't think anyone cares. But on the subject of flashback audio, can we talk about this game's overall fetish for flashbacks? Wait. I'm the writer and editor of this video, I don't need your permission. So one of the ways this game bothers me is how it's fan service the video game. The actual writing in this game is weak for Metal Gear standards, but then it picks up the tab by pumping the story full of references and explanations for things we didn't need, or are given stupid answers to just for the sake of trying to tie something from one game to another game. The dialogue is loaded with this crap as well, where characters say lines word for word from previous games just to make sure you know that this is the ultimate Metal Gear game. In Chapter 2, I just walked up to a random crop circle, and then the AI Campbell's rant about an intense light starts playing. I mean, Snake wasn't even there for that, why would he remember that now of all places? It's just a lazy way to feel Metal Gear without being Metal Gear by having people roll in their seats with, hey, I remember that, without remembering the fact that you have to actually go somewhere with this stuff like MGS2 did. As if characters going through the same routines for no reason was bad enough, the game remembers to shove this shit down your throat with actual flashbacks to previous games by mashing the X button over and over and over again when needed. Like, why? If you don't do this, it's hilarious since the game's cutscenes leave you time to press the button, meaning you just stare at nothing for a few seconds if you don't press anything. It's cool that they keep the graphics of the old games intact when doing this, but it's ultimately pointless. Like, why does MGS4 need to have Snake salute a grave at the beginning? Just so we can flash back to that time where it was really interesting, tragic, moving, revealing, and so many more things. Can't I just play the game where that was new to relive it? Part of me feels like they just did that to make sure players were still awake in these boring as all get out mission briefings. Shadow Moses itself is great since it serves the point of the story well, but no, someone says Emma's name and then we have to flash back to her 10 times. I just don't come to Metal Gear for this crap. I come to Metal Gear because Metal Gear Solids 1 through 3 and even Metal Gear 2 at its best were in moments that were really tragic, sure, but again, there was always that light at the end of the tunnel which made these characters engaging to follow. Solid Snake himself is my favorite character of all time because of how much of a hero he is despite how much crap he goes through on a daily basis, all the while carrying a profound sense of ideals. Profound ideals in the series in general is another reason why I liked it so much. Like living life to the fullest in MGS1, or using the wonders of the modern age to leave a permanent footprint in the world from MGS2, or the effects the time and place have on people in MGS3 were all the thematic reasons to love Metal Gear Solid, but 3's story was the best, not because of the thematics since MGS1 and 2 have it beat in that category, but the characters were so lovable, so villainous, or tragic, or somewhere in between, and this game takes that and dumps all over it. In addition to having good thematic ideas, but spending more time explaining it to death and actually making points. But to make up for that, they shove nostalgia so far up your ass you forget how poorly written it is at times. If it just stopped at Shadow Moses, or the final boss, it could have been so much better. But even after Shadow Moses, there's still nostalgia crap everywhere. Also, what's with the product placement in this game? The thought of product placement in video games isn't something unique to this game, but I thought it was just so jarring to play a Metal Gear game with an iPod as one of your items. 
and I really had a hard time taking it seriously as Otacon wails into his MacBook Pro over the fate of Naomi. Ugh, so much complaining, so little time. So to wrap this chapter up, wolves care about Crying Wolf for no other reason than that it was in MGS1. We make fun of how we don't have to swap discs anymore because that was in MGS1, even though switching discs is way better than shitty install screens. And we finally reach Rex, but before we do that, we have to bumble around trying to fight Vamp when the real trick is using the syringes to take away his nanomachines as he finally dies! Liquid has the real gun from Rex already, but Otacon boots up Rex to escape. Not before Naomi arrives to put the final nail in her coffin as she reveals that she's been suffering from an incurable strain of cancer and that she's been prolonging her terminal lifespan with the use of nano machines. Another complete contradiction of... Naomi, Liquid died from Fox Die too. What about me? When am I gonna go? That's up to you. What do you mean? Everybody dies when their time is up. Yeah, so when's mine up? It's up to you how you use the time left to you. Live, Snake. Like, I can't think of a single reason for her to do any of these things. It's just so inexplicable. I guess they want to have Naomi die where Grey Fox did? Also have Otacon fall in love with her just so he can cry when she dies? Because it was done in previous games. But the first time was an interesting Stockholm Syndrome angle, as that was contrasted with the relationship between Snake and Meryl, and the second time was where it was Otacon's sister, which is a much different relationship in and of itself. But the two had a very tragic history, as neither one had spent the time together they wished, but realized too late, as this was used to further the friendship between Snake and Otacon. Now we're back to a person Otacon really has absolutely no chemistry with, just because it was in MGS1. Good grief, this scene carries no weight. I do not care at all about Naomi at this point, because she's so all over the map in this game that it just doesn't matter. Also, Raiden came back and killed Vamp as the team worked together to control Metal Gear Rex to escape. Ahem. <clears throat> I know it's really jarring transition for me to be happy again, but it is amazing to actually play as a Metal Gear as Liquid Ocelot arrives in a Metal Gear Ray to fight it out. Fan service done right. It is just so fun to play as Rex duking it out with Ray, especially as you tear the thing apart more and more throughout the fight as you kick Ray in the face when he dives for you. This is followed by one of the most pointless and stupidest scenes in the game. Snake! <gasps> Fox. Again. So Snake is defeated, and Liquid gets away as he has his own arsenal gear with an army of rays, the railgun, the system, the Mount Snake more wait, what the hell? At his fingertips. Snake is about to die, and since Raiden is still a thing, he sacrifices himself to save the day, ending the chapter as Mei Ling finally appears with her crew of Marines to help Snake, Otacon, and all the rest carry out the final attack. Raiden really sucks in this game. As a character, everything that made him good is gone, and he only shows up when you need him, and that's such a damn waste. Thus ending chapter 4. Thank the stars we're on the last chapter. This briefing rivals chapter 3 for how bad it is, to the point where I stopped paying attention completely to write many rants about it in my notes. Meryl and crew are here, and Mei Ling goes over the battle plans, and by that I mean she sees how hot Johnny is and intentionally drops her pointer so she can stick her ass in his face by picking it up. You just can't make this crap up. They try to be so funny with him now, like when Mei Ling walks by and he tries to grab her ass and Meryl stops him in a disapproving manner. This is weaponizable levels of cringe, and it really takes a whole lot away from the climax. Like when all the characters dramatically walk towards the cannon they're firing themselves out of to get onto Liquid's ship. This could really be an emotional moment since all the characters know this fight is win or lose. No chance to retreat. Remember, no matter what happens, I'll be with you till the very end. You are my pride and joy. But they take away from this by having Johnny fucking faceplant on the side of Arsenal gear and fall into the ocean instead of just landing with the rest of the team. This is not funny! I did not laugh at that! I groaned, since this is supposed to be the climax of the Metal Gear series. So Snake must run his way through generic hallways, firing at enemy hordes, until he finds Meryl unconscious with dozens of enemies around, and this is when Screaming Mantis arrives to give us that horrific boss fight. Right out of the blue, Johnny arrives to save the day. 
writers. If he's going to be the one that saves Meryl from Screaming Mantis in a super dramatic fashion, why did they have him fail to land on the ship in a super stupid and forced attempt at comedy? Couldn't it have been ambiguous where he landed? Maybe give this idiot some credibility? Only a little. To make matters worse, Screaming Mantis is working alongside Psycho Mantis from beyond the grave. Why would they do that? This review just keeps writing itself. I mean, remember when Psycho Mantis died? This is the first time I've ever used my power to help someone. It's strange. It feels kind of nice. But here he's making a complete ass out of himself, telling me to put my controller on the floor as he can't control me because we're on PS3. Far too complicated for him. I mean, how many times do I have to say this? This crap is cool the first time. In a game with good writing and characters, not again for the sake of pandering in a game with bad writing. Also, Mantis literally exists in a game on PS4. Snake decides to go ahead and be the one who takes Otacon to the Patriot Central Control Unit, but to get there he must first travel through a microwave hallway. And on the way he has an old man nanomachine spaz attack as troops arrive. Literally put their guns away pull their knives out, and slowly walk towards Snake. That is the very textbook definition of fucking contrived. I really don't want to say more, that just makes no freaking sense. Raiden arrives to save Snake as he tends to do in this game, and this is the one area of the story I really like in this game, and that's Snake's guilt for Raiden. He feels bad since Raiden's whole life is so screwed because of what the Patriots did to the guy just to make him exactly like Snake. But in reality, Snake is the one with nowhere to go after this, not Raiden, which is why he wants to risk his own life in the microwave so Raiden doesn't have to. This microwave scene is one of the most famous in gaming as the iconic hero Solid Snake is stumbling through this microwave as his sneaking suit is burning. It really is brutal imagery. However, I'm going to be honest and say that this scene is a great idea, but it would be better in a better game. I was not lying when I say I tuned out of this game after Chapter 3 since it betrayed the series so much. Unfortunately, the scene didn't carry much weight since the climax has so many problems, leaving me to think about the detailed shot of Snake's ass. I mean, the previous scene showed Johnny and Meryl having a love fest while shooting at the frog troops as they literally proposed to each other and argued like a married couple. It's literally like that highway scene from The Incredibles, only it's the climax of Metal Gear Solid 4. So attempts at seriousness fall flat, which is a shame since I want to be moved by this when I'm just not. So a bit of post-production here. Uh, I actually went back and watched this full scene of Snake in the microwave hallway again a few weeks out from having played it myself, and it honestly was a lot more emotional. I really got emotional when watching this footage because of the fact that it just felt so sad. I don't know what to say. It's just so dramatic and so upsetting and just so brutal. I mean, it's, it's just, it's not the hardest torture scene, if we're going to call it that, but like... It's just, it certainly looks it, but, uh, from like a story perspective, but yeah, I think that's the reason is because when that proves what I was saying, when in a void, that is one of the best parts in gaming when it comes to the emotions. But when it comes to its actual place in Metal Gear Solid 4, and I'm playing the game, when I'm marathoning the game for a review, it just sort of falls flat. Now, anyway, let's get back to the review. Otacon successfully uploads the virus that destroys GW once and for all, deactivating Liquid's troops along with it. Ending the war economy, ending the system, all that shit as Naomi comes on the projector talking about how she knew they would destroy the system since remember, Naomi's a genius at all things computers in this game, as she and Sonny wrote the virus program called Fox Alive. So I guess Sonny actually did do something in this game, but yes, they finally did it. Otacon also cries again and completely contradicts himself. I'm done crying. I don't have any more tears to shed. <laughs> Don't think it's over though, we still have a whopping hour and a half left. Snake passes out and wakes up on top of Arsenal gear as Liquid admits this is exactly what he wanted, freedom from the Patriot system, and for some reason, despite his base of operations being where GW is held, he just waited for the heroes to find a way to shut down for him. Ocelot teaches Snake about the Philosopher's Legacy, even though Eva did the same thing earlier in the story, but hey, Portable Ops, it's there, it was canon. Oh, Twin Snakes is here as well, now you know a scene's good. In all seriousness, did this scene need to exist? I thought for sure that most of this information about Big Boss trying to create world without politics for soldiers was, one, already implied at the end of Snake Eater, 
two, already stated by Big Mama, and three, clearly obvious if you've ever played the game and watched every other slideshow speech, skipping out on Big Mama's entirely. So we helped Ocelot reach his goal and fulfilled the boss's vision without even knowing it. What a twist. But for some reason, Liquid still wants to have a final showdown with Snake because he does. It was also this game where we really started acting like Solid Snake and Liquid Snake have some kind of poetic, deep, and perennial struggle when it's just not the case, but I can save that shit for the Phantom Pain. Despite those flashy riding fights with Vamp, Snake vs Liquid Ocelot is by far the best bit of choreography in the entire game. No over-the-top flips, it's just a bare-handed fight to the death between Nano Machine, Syringe-reliant old men. Which somehow just seems apt for the Metal Gear series finale. It gets really good when the main theme of the game kicks in around the halfway mark. Okay, it's a little corny for Snake and Ocelot to refill each other's health, even if it's a cool visual, but this begins what is easily one of my favorite final bosses in gaming. I mean that sincerely. The mechanics completely change for this, which I've complained about in other games, but here it works. It's very simple to understand and get to grips with, as the only objective is to beat the shit out of Ocelot. In fact, the mechanics are really simple to the point where if that was it, then the effect might not have been as strong. But the thing that elevates this would be the fact that we got retro-styled health bars and the most prominent music from MGS 1, 2, and 3. I don't like how it uses Solid Snake and Naked Snake interchangeably, since they are not the same by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, look, can I just enjoy this game for 5 seconds as we get nostalgia that works well, as this is what should have been the final moment of gameplay in the franchise? <laughs> I realize that it's not the most fair thing to give the final boss a free pass for gimmicky nostalgia when I hate it in 95% of the rest of the game, but what can I say, having that in the final boss felt more earned than in the main game. You know, the time to build your own identity. In fact, I probably would have enjoyed it more if you just cut the shitty callback dialogue and flashbacks and just left Shadow Moses and the final boss. But anyway, Ocelot finally dies, but before he goes out it's pretty much confirmed that he was in control the whole time of just doing a liquid act. But we still have another hour and 10 minutes to go! You could almost watch the entirety of Batman Mask of the Phantasm in that time. I'm not too mad, I mean at least not yet, because as what was intended to close the saga for good, you wouldn't want a half-baked and rushed ending. Despite that though, a surprisingly little amount of things happened beyond exposition. Meryl's getting married to Johnny, Campbell arrives as Meryl finally forgives the guy for being a weirdo, and everyone's happy to celebrate the occasion. Except for me, because I'm still mad that one of the last things to happen in the attempted final game is Meryl marrying a joke side character that has done nothing but shit his pants for years and is now suddenly good looking. Sonny's character name and obsession with cooking eggs is revealed as she gets a good look at the sun for the first time. Now that the world is safe from the control of patriots, her eggs are sunny side up. Get out. Raiden is in a hospital bed, somehow cured of being a robot, as Rose walks in with her son, John, as Raiden gives the usual depressed speech about the beauty and the beast until she reveals that it's not Campbell's son, it's his, and that in order to protect them all from the Patriots' eye, they left Raiden alone as Rose and Campbell pretended to be married to fool the Patriots. Now everyone is wonderful and happy as Raiden's with his new family. What a wonderful way to end a terrible character arc. You know, by bringing Raiden exactly where he was at the end of the last game. Only now it comes after moping around, acting like he's an animal as he sounds all edgy and shit. But finally, we get what is the best part of this entire game as Snake walks into the grave we started the story in, knowing he has 3-6 to six months before becoming a bioweapon of mass destruction, 
and the mission is over and it's time for Snake's final act of heroism as he loads a bullet in his gun and puts the gun in his mouth, the camera pans up, and the shot fires. That scene gives me chills, almost brings a tear to my eye just thinking about it. The timing and volume of the music, the camera angles, it's just beautiful and from a story perspective, as I said towards the beginning of the review, Solid Snake really did not deserve this, but this is the hand he was dealt and he takes it like a true boss. But anyway, the exposition carries on as Drebin reveals that he was controlled by the Patriots, Rat Patrol Team 10 was controlled by the Patriots, and so was Philanthropy again. The Patriots wanted them to take out Liquid before he wiped them out, which they all did do anyway, so sucks to be the Patriots. Skipping the boring stuff about Sonny's character, let's have a listen to one of my favorite lines from Otacon in this entire game as Sonny asks where Snake is, and we already know from the previous scene. The music, the delivery, it's just on point. I wonder if I'll ever see him again. Snake had a hard life. He needs some time to rest. As Sonny and Otacon stare into the sunset, the game ends. A great way to go out for such a mixed pathway here. Until the game dumps all over it. We have 40 minutes left as Snake in fact did not shoot himself and is at the grave of Big Boss. Was this the grave Solid Snake saluted at the beginning? Why? In case you didn't know, Snake doesn't like the guy. But then, Big Boss returns from the dead. This scene ruins it all. I would have forgiven almost everything if this game ended on that beautiful tragic note, but instead, Big Boss returns to deliver some more slideshow exposition. This scene is interesting to say the absolute least for about 10 minutes. But they managed to make a scene where Solid Snake and Big Boss, now that we know what we know about him, talk for the first time since Metal Gear 2, boring as all hell. Let's talk about the good stuff. I like the CQC hug. Big Boss has brought what's left of Major Zero back with him, and he knows that the death of Zero will finally end all this, and the timing of the music and the acting is great. We had helped turn Zero into 100. His sin was ours. And for that reason, I'm taking it upon myself to send Zero back to nothing. Richard Doyle is great as Elderly Big Boss, and that's about it. Big Boss explains a lot of stuff that we, again, already knew or could have guessed beforehand, but he does explain one thing that sucked. Earlier in the story, Eva was all upset about Big Boss's burning corpse, however, this was actually Solidus' body, which you can tell because Big Boss and Solidus are missing opposite eyes. Eva clearly knows this because of the fact that she sees Snake with his solid eye and remembers Big Boss's other eye being missing, so was Eva in on this or an idiot? To account for Big Boss's return, they explained that parts of his body burned away by Snake were replaced by pieces drawn on from the bodies of Liquid and Solidus. I mean, that's how Ocelot got his hand back, so I guess it's not out of the question. But this is just such an obnoxious way for a game to end as we say the same things over and over and over. I swear, count how many times Big Boss says take Zero back to nothing or that Snake is free. They made this scene so boring that I was just completely tuned out. As Big Boss salutes the boss's grave for the final time before dying himself. But we already did the MGS3 flashback. You can't just cash that check twice thinking we won't notice. Oh, also, Big Boss mentions that Snake erased him twice before, but we all know that was Venom Snake in Metal Gear 1. You know what? There's enough to talk about with Metal Gear Solid 4 that Venom can wait. But as Big Boss dies, Snake finds out that he won't become a weapon of mass destruction, but his old age will catch up with him soon enough, and that he should live. Which he does alongside Otacon as shown by the end credits. Finally ending, Metal Gear Solid 4, Guns of the Patriots. What can I say about Guns of the Patriots? Well, a lot of course, but in conclusion, do I hate this game? My answer to that is an unenthusiastic, not really, with a question mark at the end. I'd like to think that I've matured somewhat in my time on YouTube, and while I hate a lot of the things about this game as a reviewer and a fan, I'm definitely not going to flip tables over it. This game didn't ruin my childhood or anything like that, since that's just dramatic. 
Metal Gear 1, 2, Solid 1, 2, Twin Snakes, most importantly Snake Eater and Portable Ops, I guess, aren't going anywhere anytime soon. This game really does make me mad as a Metal Gear fanatic, but it's not a broken mess or anything, I just don't like it that much. As a video game on its own, an area that I spent almost no time on in this video, Metal Gear Solid 4 is an amazing third person shooter with top tier production values for 2008. So if that's what you're looking for, this will probably be one of, if not your favorite Metal Gear game. But I happen to not care about third person shooting and definitely value good writing in MGS and Guns of the Patriots really fails there. I mean, I could skip the cutscenes, but all of the things I'm looking for in an MGS game were already in Snake Eater, and to a lesser extent, Sons of Liberty, and all the previous games, so instead of lamenting what MGS4 does not have, I'm just going to shrug my shoulders and pop Snake Eater in again. That sounds like fun. But if I'm talking about Guns of the Patriots, I can't fathom why great ideas like instant reloads were cut out. Why bosses and enemies were bullet sponges. Why gunplay was so prioritized in general now that I think about it. But those are the reasons why I'm probably rarely going to pick this one up again. If at all, since other than Octo Camo, Battle Analog Control, and Crouch Walking, I will just play Snake Eater since it does everything else better. Even the stuff MGS4 does better, like simpler CQC, that is certainly not something I'm unwilling to put up with in Snake Eater. But as for a story, what I think has the largest impact on Guns of the Patriots was this game's unshakable need to explain everything in the Metal Gear series. It has always been stated that these were questions never meant to be answered, and I have respect for Kojima and all those in the writer's room for trying and giving their best effort, but Guns of the Patriots just loses its own unique identity in the midst of all these explanations to questions that didn't need answers since more plot holes come about in place of the questions. Explaining Metal Gear to its absolute core is a task that just simply cannot be achieved without undermining what makes it great to begin with. But then again, MGS4 already has a massive identity issue as is given the fact that this game won't stop with all the nostalgia crap. But what the game's story excels at would be the emotions. All of the best moments in this game are incredibly emotional, which resonated with me and so many other players across the world. However, when you pull back the curtain, I can't escape the sea of bad writing hidden there. Metal Gear Solid 4 was about as good as I remembered from three years ago. A decent game, but not one I'm clawing at the bit to play again. But as a game, it's pretty good, if not what I want from this series. And it's definitely not even the worst Metal Gear Solid game, not by a long shot. Speaking of which, as promised, to make up for the lack of Metal Gear reviews, I'm now going to tackle Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. Remember, I at least think this game is fun and the story has good ideas and emotions in it. <sighs> Keep me in your prayers, guys. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time.